Welcome to Switzerland. Did you know that our country is not just a great place to visit, but also your first-class business location? We are centrally located in Europe, and we have the world's best infrastructure. Oh, and the train is always on time, so let's take a journey. Did you know that Switzerland has four official languages? Yeah? No? Forse? Becidia? Don't worry, we also have excellent English skills. However, we don't spend all day chatting. We love to work. In 2012, we could have voted for longer holidays, and we voted against them. It's crazy, isn't it? But we're not crazy. Our economy and government are among the world's most stable. That, combined with our outstanding talent pool and a deregulated labor market, makes Switzerland the most innovative and competitive nation in the world. Our Swiss dual education system provides an excellent mix of both vocational education and apprenticeships. Now let's take a look at industry. Maybe Germany, the United States and China are well known for their industrial output. But did you know that Swiss industrial production per capita beats all of them? Sorry guys. Our country is small, but hey, three Swiss companies are among the global top 20 most valuable companies. Furthermore, we offer the best quality of life. That's why three Swiss cities are among the world's best for the highest quality of living. In addition, Switzerland is one of the happiest nations on the globe. Perhaps because we eat on average 12 kilograms of chocolate per year? Switzerland is the best location for innovation, has stable political, economic and financial conditions, has the highest living standard and welcomes your business. So tell us now, when will you invest in Switzerland? Switzerland Global Enterprise, enabling new business. Find out more at s-ge.com.
For us in the Aditya Birla Group, Odisha has been one of our most preferred investment destinations. Chief Minister Sri Naveen Patnaik's exceptional leadership has been the singular factor in the rapid progress of Odisha. The state government has leveraged its competitive advantages, including its progressive policies and governance framework are a big pull factor. Join the juggernaut.
In healthcare, a vast ecosystem is helping therapy innovators become more patient-centric and more effective than ever before. Cytiva supports researchers, biopharma, and clinicians in the pursuit of more targeted treatments. In discovery, speed and accuracy are everything. The faster and smarter researchers can work, the more patients benefit. To ensure that new, more targeted therapies become reality, we're equipping biomanufacturers with the tools and expertise they need to produce cost-effectively and quickly. How can tens of thousands of individualized patient doses be manufactured quickly, efficiently, and securely? The answer, with a healthy dose of expertise and innovation. We're creating processes and solutions that are scalable and address complex needs. We work to deliver diagnostic tools and other technologies to bring the right therapy to the right patient at the right time so that life-saving medicines come within the reach of more people and could save more lives. Cell culture, protein purification, biomarker imaging and analysis. It may not be what most think about when envisioning the future of healthcare, but this is what we do. Our part in changing the world. Advancing and accelerating. Discovery, manufacturing, diagnostics, future therapeutics.
to regulatory compliance is long and filled with choices. With a combination of standards, process, and service, USP can help guide your path to compliant, quality products. Trust the standard that sets the benchmark for medicines. Our robust and collaborative scientific process is part of our comprehensive approach. We offer reference standards that are tied to USP monographs to help you minimize risk and enhance your confidence and compliance, reduce time and resources spent developing in-house standards, and streamline your path to regulatory compliance. We work with independent volunteer scientific experts who rigorously review and approve our standards, which undergo testing by USP and other laboratories around the world. Ongoing testing of our standards helps ensure the quality of your product over time, and only USP reference standards are linked to official USP NF monographs that provide specifications for the identity, purity, and potency to meet FDA requirements without further in-house qualification and the need of our global customers. With USP, you have access to our in-house scientific experts to guide you every step of the way. In addition to our best-in-class USP reference standards, we offer training, education, and other services. Our online resources help smooth your path to regulatory compliance. Our standards provide precise testing and validation guidelines, as well as reference samples for testing. Drugs can be made consistently every time. We are more than reference standards. We provide a unique combination of standards, process, and service. From buying to applying standards, we support your bottom line with reference standards that have been rated best in class by our customers. Talk with us to find out how we can help you navigate your journey to regulatory compliance. Contact USP at USP.org. Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India and its public sector undertaking Biotechnology Industry Research Assistance Council. BIRAC are organizing the second edition of Global Bio India from 1st to 3rd March 2021 on digital platform. The first edition in 2019 at Aero City, New Delhi was a huge success with participation from over 25 plus countries, 190 exhibitors, 2500 plus delegates, 300 plus startups, 50 plus incubators, 60 plus research institutes, 800 plus business meetings scheduling and representation from 9 states. India offers a unique destination as innovation hub and biomanufacturing hub for the world. Large talent pool, growing capacities for frugal innovation and manufacturing of affordable, globally competent products and technologies in healthcare, agriculture and allied area, food and nutrition, waste to value, sanitation and clean energy solutions. 
biotechnology sector is recognized as the sunrise sector that would have multiplier cascading impact on achieving India's USD 5 trillion economy target by 2024. Government of India initiatives reiterates the significance of biotechnology sector as the sunshine sector. Global Bio India 2021 the largest bio event which showcases India's biotech sector strength and opportunities at global level. Global Bio India 2021 is expected to draw around 5,000 plus delegates from across the globe. <music> Department of Biotechnology BIRAC, along with its autonomous institutes, has been at the forefront in the nation's fight against COVID-19. The Tableau, India Fights COVID by Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, showcasing significant contribution of biotechnology sector in the development of vaccine. Under Make in India mission, India is now gearing up to become innovation hub and bio-manufacturing hub for India and for the world. This happens to be the most exciting time to host Global Bio India 2021, India's largest biotech event, led by DBT and BIRAC in partnership with CII, ABLE and Invest India. Together, we can transform billions of lives worldwide join us on the biotech journey global bio india 2021 jai hind welcome to switzerland did you know that our country is not just a great place to visit but also your first class business location we are centrally located in europe and we have the world's best infrastructure oh and the train is always on time so let's take a journey did you know that Switzerland has four official languages? Yeah? No? Forse? Becidia? Don't worry, we also have excellent English skills. However, we don't spend all day chatting. We love to work. In 2012, we could have voted for longer holidays and we voted against them. It's crazy, isn't it? But we're not crazy. Our economy and government are among the world's most stable. That, combined with our outstanding talent pool and a deregulated labor market, makes Switzerland the most innovative and competitive nation in the world. Our Swiss dual education system provides an excellent mix of both vocational education and apprenticeships. Now let's take a look at industry. Maybe Germany, the United States and China are well known for their industrial output. But did you know that Swiss industrial production per capita beats all of them? Sorry guys. Our country is small, but hey, three Swiss companies are among the global top 20 most valuable companies. Furthermore, we offer the best quality of life. That's why three Swiss cities are among the world's best for the highest quality of living. In addition, Switzerland is one of the happiest nations on the globe. Perhaps because we eat on average 12 kilograms of chocolate per year? Switzerland is the best location for innovation has stable political, economic, and financial conditions, has the highest living standard, and welcomes your business. So tell us now, when will you invest in Switzerland? Switzerland Global Enterprise, enabling new business. Find out more at s-ge.com.
For us in the Aditya Birla Group, Odisha has been one of our most preferred investment destinations. Chief Minister Sri Naveen Patnaik's exceptional leadership has been the singular factor in the rapid progress of Odisha. The state government has leveraged its competitive advantages, including its progressive policies and governance framework are a big pull factor. Come join the juggernaut.
In healthcare, a vast ecosystem is helping therapy innovators become more patient-centric and more effective than ever before. Cytiva supports researchers, biopharma, and clinicians in the pursuit of more targeted treatments. In discovery, speed and accuracy are everything. The faster and smarter researchers can work, the more patients benefit. To ensure that new, more targeted therapies become reality, we're equipping biomanufacturers with the tools and expertise they need to produce cost-effectively and quickly. How can tens of thousands of individualized patient doses be manufactured quickly, efficiently, and securely? The answer, with a healthy dose of expertise and innovation. We're creating processes and solutions that are scalable and address complex needs. We work to deliver diagnostic tools and other technologies to bring the right therapy to the right patient at the right time. So that life-saving medicines come within the reach of more people and could save more lives. Cell culture, protein purification, biomarker imaging and analysis. It may not be what most think about when envisioning the future of healthcare, but this is what we do. Our part in changing the world. Advancing and accelerating. Discovery, manufacturing, diagnostics, future therapeutics.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Vinita Chaudhary from Department of Biotechnology. The focus of this session is on antimicrobial resistance and neglected diseases. The station will discuss feasible strategies to support innovative technological interventions to tackle problems associated with neglected tropical diseases, antimicrobial resistance, and other infectious diseases in India. The department is willing to expand its strategic partnerships by collaborating with Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, DNDI, and Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARP, to support affordable medical innovations that meets the treatment needs of patients affected by neglected uh, diseases, antimicrobial resistance, and other infectious diseases. In the backdrop of recent COVID-19 pandemic, there's a discrete need to rethink AMR's position as part of the global health agenda as COVID-19 will affect the global response to AMR in both positive and negative ways. To discuss this at length, we have a distinguished speakers in this afternoon, Dr. Rodrigo H. Offering from WHO, Dr. Bernard Picol from DNDI, Dr. Monica Balasegaram from GARP, Mr. Pankaj Patel from Jadas Kerala. After this session, we have panel discussion on fostering innovation and R&D to address infectious diseases in India and beyond. Due to some unavoidable circumstances, Dr. Renu Sarup, Secretary DBT, is unable to attend this session. Now I invite Dr. Sandeep Sari, advisor DBT, to deliver the opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Vinita, for your kind words. And I welcome you all uh, to this uh, very important session on AMR and neglected diseases in Global by India 2021. As you all know, India, along with the entire world, is currently facing one of the greatest pandemics of this century, with most of its resources diverted in finding solutions to mitigate the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. India, which is very well globally known as pharmacy of the world, has undertaken commendable efforts to develop COVID-19 vaccines swiftly. As you know that two of the vaccines, Covishield as well as uh, Covaxin, have been given emergency use authorization. Administration of these vaccines have been initiated earlier to health workers and frontline workers. And now from 1st of March, these have been further given to population which is aged 60 and above and person with 45 plus with comorbidities. Even during these challenging times, we should not forget that AMR challenge is probably an even graver and persistent issue than the COVID-19 challenge, which if not solved, will lead to dire consequences. In India, the fight against AMR is multi-stakeholder with involvement of government agencies, private companies with focus ranging from policy to research to implementation. Government has taken a very active role in public funding of innovators, academics and researchers across the board. Role of public-private partnerships in working together to innovate to address AMR at scale is very crucial. This also reflects the understanding that there is no one solution and that we have to be prepared to fund and deal with the failures that come with developing a basket of solutions. India has also developed a national action plan for AMR, which really works by looking at challenges which the country faces. Surveillance networks for basic understanding of the hotspots and a multi-pronged approach have been initiated to tackle AMR as per the national action plan. India, through Department of Biotechnology and its PSU BIRAC, is implementing several programs like Grand Challenges Program, NCEPI, National Biopharma Mission, One Health Program that are playing an active role in creating an ecosystem for reduced usage of antibiotics through the development of surveillance networks, diagnostics, vaccines, pipeline of targeted drugs, as well as other ancillary requirements to mitigate the challenge of AMR in a country-specific manner. We have developed the repositories for AMR and we have given uh, mission AMR. We are developing the, along with WHO's health, the country's first priority pathogen list, which will be discussed in this session also, I believe. Also, India is also focusing on what we do well, that is developing low cost and affordable solutions to diagnostics that are suitable for developing countries. That is important for sustainability as AMR is not going to be an acute pandemic. It will be a chronic one. The current strength of developing diagnostics we can easily see from the COVID situation. 
from the net importer in the initial one month or two months now we basically are self sufficient in this area and probably exporting to many countries covid 19 pandemic has shown the critical linkages between the human and animal interface and the need to strengthen health systems and surveillance for humans animals and environment covid 19 has also highlighted the importance of looking at the emergence of zoonotic diseases including infectious caused by resistant pathogens and therefore the importance of preventing infectious diseases protecting biodiversity and encouraging agricultural practices that rely on the uh, prudent use of antimicrobials ama is an urgent and growing global health crisis which requires transparent coordinated and decisive action across countries we are delighted to announce that collaborative partnership with dndi and gartp through bireac in this session which will help bridge the current gaps and improve the efficiency of research and innovation in terms of antimicrobials development for easily accessible and affordable technological interventions to combat problems associated with amr bireac is in the process of signing an mou or an loi with dndi and gartp for this strategic partnership i look forward to an emerging and engaging session that will help us understand what changes are needed to reshape strategies for combating antimicrobial resistance globally how can we improve the efficient and effective use of diagnostics globally for the diagnosis of bacterial and viral infections and the need to raise awareness and communicate the importance of one health approach in addressing amr thank you once again to all of you and now i'll hand it over to suman to carry out the proceedings thank you sir The first talk of this afternoon is by Dr. Rodrigo H. Offrin from WHO on AMR pathogen priority list and WHO's vision for AMR and neglected diseases. Over to Dr. Offrin. Dr. Offrin. Uh, you will need to unmute, sir. Please. Doctor Offrin, you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. Hello. Good afternoon. Am I back? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, first, for the invitation, and uh, I'm very happy to represent WHO uh, in this very important agenda. It's two important agendas for us: AMR and neglected diseases. Good afternoon, dignitaries, officials, and participants. Antimicrobial resistance is a slow-moving, silent pandemic. I think that it is a global threat. Everyone recognizes this, except that when things move slow, uh, we all also become complacent to and move our resources and focus to what is urgent. It is a global health and development threat with tremendous impact on health and the economy. An estimated 10 million deaths per year and 100 trillion dollars impact on the global economy by 2050 is what all researchers have projected. AMR is a flagship priority for WHO, uh, especially the regional office of Southeast Asia, based out of Delhi, and one since uh, since 2014, and one of the focus areas for WHO India. Uh, WHO India, our, our office is very proud to collaborate with the Department of Biotechnology's Mission AMR to develop the Indian Priority Pathogen List or IPPL for prioritizing the list of drug-resistant microbial pathogens of national relevance. I would also like to congratulate DBT for their collaboration with Guard P and Bhakti and Iraq for new research. This is where we need to really invest. Uh, especially as we have some more time to find out solutions for AMR. This IPPL is aligned with the WHO's global priority list of anti antibiotic resistant bacteria and followed a similar methodology for its development with inputs from experts across various domain uh, areas in India. The purpose of the IPPL is to guide the prioritization of research on AMR, including incentives and funding, help align R&D priorities with Indian public health needs, and support India's leadership in the containment of antibiotic resistance bacteria. 
the launch of the IPPL later today, this evening, comes at an opportune time. As the pharmacy of the world, India has a responsibility for development of novel and cost-effective antibiotics. It's not just a responsibility, but the capacity. We have seen this in COVID response, where India is a resource for the response. We hope the IPPL shall help facilitate prioritization of research and development of new and effective antibiotics from India's On another stream, uh, tropical diseases. Emerging AMR also comprises global action against leprosy and Kalazar, which are neglected tropical diseases or NTDs. To ensure the continued efficacy of available drugs, WHO and partners are supporting the government of India in monitoring and surveillance of NTDs, which are a diverse set of 20 conditions caused by parasites, bacteria, viruses, fungi, toxins, affecting around 1.7 billion people worldwide. Huge progress has been made since the global launch of, of the WHO roadmap and the 2012 uh, London Declaration, where organizations, governments, research institutes, many of whom are in this panel, and pharmaceutical companies pledge to work together to control and, and eliminate at least 10 NTDs. Today, around 500 million fewer people are at risk of NTDs, and 42 countries have eliminated at least one NTD. The region has many stories of this, and India is also one of them. India contributes around 35% of the global burden of NTDs in terms of disability adjusted life years. To hashtag end the neglect, which is our slogan, and ensure no one is left behind, WHO has launched a new roadmap for NTDs for 2021 to 2030 and sets global targets and milestones to prevent, control, eliminate, or eradicate 20 diseases and disease groups. Uh, WHO India supports eight highly endemic states through a network of technical teams on elimination of vis visceral leish leishmaniasis, lymphatic filariasis, and leprosy. They are present in, in these very difficult districts, trying to do the last mile for elimination of such diseases. Um, uh, j just as a story is that uh, we are in the last 16 di endemic districts for Kalazar. Uh, these are in Jharkhand and Bihar. And many of the last mile efforts are actually outside the health sector whether it is building uh, what they call paka houses or, or reaching out to tribal minorities. This is where the last mile investment needs to happen. I think to sum up, AMR and NTDs are not just public health issues. They are very much cross-sectoral and the solutions to, to both these public health problems are also lie in the collaboration with other sectors. They are both major developmental threats that lower productivity, increase poverty, and overburden health systems to derail progress made towards attaining the SDGs. Again, um, I always say that, uh, yes, a lot of the burden of disease and potential threats of AMR entities are in India, but India is a resource. And WHO is committed to support the government of India and all partners to overcome the challenges of AMR and NTDs in India. With that, I'd like to thank you. And I'll be listening to the deliberations and how well we can also partner after these uh, uh, discussions this afternoon for uh, a better, better work in terms of our uh, collaborative work uh, for AMR and NTDs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Offrin, uh, for sharing your thoughts and perspectives on pathogen priority list of AMR and uh, neglected tropical diseases. Now I request my colleague, Dr. Suman Rizal from DNDI to carry forward the proceedings. Over to you, Dr. Suman. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, uh, Dr. Vinita. Uh, now I will uh, like, to, like, to, like to invite Dr. Bernard Pikul, who is the Executive Director of Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative, and he has been the since the, its foundation in 2003 to make a presentation on the DNDI's uh, alternative model of development. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suman. 
But not you need to unmute. Hello. Yes. Um, good. Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here with all of you. I want to thank DBT and BIWAC for giving us a wonderful opportunity to collaborate. Working together, we can maximize Indian R&D capacity, accelerate the development and delivery of urgently needed drugs, increase access to new technology, and improve health for all in India and globally. The Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative, DNDI, is an international non-for-profit organization that discover, develop, and deliver safe, effective, and affordable treatment for the most neglected patients. We use the power of innovation, open science, partnerships, and advocacy to find solutions to treat injustice, the lack of medicines for life threatening diseases that disproportionately impact poor and margin marginalized people. DNDI was created uh, in 2003 when five leading research institutions uh, from India, the Indian Council of Medical Research, Brazil, Kenya, Malaysia, and France, together with the World Health Organization, team up with Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF, as an experiment in innovation for access. We are driven by collaboration, not competition, and by patient needs, not profit. Our end-to-end -end operational model joins the public and private sector with scientists, industry, academia, and affected communities in low- and middle-income countries to develop treatment when patient medical needs have been neglected. Our model starts with drug discovery and preclinical research, proceeding to clinical trials and large-scale implementation studies, all with the focus on ensuring sustainable access to new innovation for patients in need. Together with our partners, we have proven that this model works by already delivering uh, eight treatments for neglected disease, including the first oral treatment for African sleeping sickness, as well as new Kalaza treatment for South Asia. We strongly believe that in fostering new innovation ecosystem centered on public health needs, and that is why today collaboration is so exciting. With BIVAC and partners, we will co-create projects for sustainable solutions, share expertise and our global networks, and support the development of capacity and skills of the Indian biotechnology industry in the area relevant for India. Millions of people around the world rely on India's extensive expertise in medical research and innovation and a critical role it play in ensuring access to affordable, life-saving medicine. Building on this success and cultivating new patient-centered R&D partnership in India has the potential to transform the landscape and trajectory of neglected diseases R&D and bring new hope for neglected patients. With BIRAC, we will harness, strengthen, and collaborate strategically with the Indian R&D ecosystem to deliver efficacious, safe, and affordable products for people suffering from neglected tropical diseases, viral diseases, and other infectious diseases outbreaks. At the same time, we will strengthen translation capacity, conduct phase one studies, and develop and register new chemical entities in India we can jointly engage with industrial partners to engage sustainable production, supply, and distribution of the treatment to patients suffering from negative diseases and infectious diseases. I once again thank BIRAC for collaboration with us. Together, we can deliver the best science for negative patients in India and around the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pikul, for uh, highlighting us on the 
the NDI's model for drug development of neglected diseases and also highlighting the aspirations for DNDI to partner with Myrac for innovation for India and beyond. Now I move forward and invite Dr. Manika Balasegram, who is the Executive Director of Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, to make his presentation on the GARP's vision, especially from an Indian perspective. Thank you, Manika. Um, so thank you all um, very much. Um, and um, I'm going to give a fairly um, in a way, fairly uh, similar presentation to what um, Bernard has done, um, really in terms of uh, um, uh, you know what uh, God P will be doing uh, going forward in in India, really looking at how um, we can accelerate research and development um, into access uh, uh, as well. But I think really starting um, in in terms of what we are and what we do. Um, I'd like to start by just um, focusing on our vision, and our vision is really to make sure that infections are treatable for everyone everywhere. The emphasis really being um, that we need to ensure that the treatments we develop are um, accessible. Uh, and I think this is extremely important in the context of um, COVID-19, where um, increasingly we see that our access to countermeasures are extremely critical in dealing um, uh, with uh, emerging uh, infectious diseases, outbreaks, and pandemics. And we really need to see um, antimicrobial resistance in the same light. If we are um, ready to address this issue, we need to ensure that we can not just develop appropriate countermeasures such as antibiotics and diagnostics and vaccines, but we absolutely need to make sure that these tools are available and accessible, particularly where they are needed the most. In terms of our um, uh, mission, um, GARP is an organization that was created by WHO and DNDI. Uh, and like DNDI, we aim to bring both the public and private sectors together to develop new treatments and make sure they are accessible. Uh, as Bernard said, we believe in collaborating, collaboration and partnership, uh, and that is really the DNA of our model. Our focus is on the bacteria on the WHO priority pathogen list. Uh, but apart from just looking at the bugs, we also look at two other important components. What are the diseases we have to focus on and the populations that are disproportionately affected by drug resistance and sadly remain um, underserved. Um, our, we, our focus is also on late stage clinical development uh, and access. Uh, and we currently already have started to build a portfolio of projects, including um, uh, projects that are focusing on vulnerable populations such as new, neonates uh, and uh, newborns and children. Um, but we are also um, focusing on projects uh, looking at repurposing, combining old drugs, as well as new chemical entities, drugs that are now currently under phase three development, uh, and that can really bring significant added value in treating drug resistant infections. As noted, our approach is, is around investing to save lives, it's around innovative partnerships, of which we've already built uh, a significant number in many countries, and about um, delivering uh, impact. Um, of course, it's, it's uh, no surprise to say this, it has already been noted by other speakers, but India has some of the highest antibiotic resistant rates. Um, we know uh, what are the uh, bugs of concern, but it's also important to understand where this problem is playing out. Uh, and in India, like in many, many other countries in the world, this is playing out in the most vulnerable populations. I give the example here on the neonatal mortality rate. Uh, from 2017 in India to 23.5 deaths per thousand live births. And unfortunately, um, this is increasingly being driven um, by drug resistant infections. Um, uh, it's been cited that there are already 700,000 deaths due to drug resistant bacterial infections. Uh, but unfortunately, we are already seeing around 200 to 300,000 deaths a year in the neonatal po population alone. So it's extremely important we understand that this is infecting one of the most vulnerable and most important populations. And if you therefore look at the disability adjusted life years due to this, it is very significant. So it is something that requires urgent attention. However, as also alluded to um, earlier, um, India offers also significant possibilities uh, in terms of providing solutions, not just to India and its population, but to the world. And we are also seeing that playing out with COVID-19 um, and again, this will play out uh, in uh, antimicrobial resistance. And I think this is where um, the possibilities 
uh, are extremely important and extremely exciting in many ways. The Indian ecosystem includes public institutes um, that can play an important role in catalyzing innovation, research and development and access. Uh, it includes um, small, medium-sized enterprises. There are small companies based here in India who are really conducting novel and exciting um, uh, research and development around novel drugs, vaccines and, and diagnostics. Um, there are pharmaceutical companies um, that have the cap capacity to do um, pharmaceutical manufacturing and scale up uh, and ensure that antibiotics can be made available to the world. Um, there are contract drug manufacturers that can work on complex problems, uh, including on um, pharmaceutical development on CMC formulation and ensuring that these are appropriate for different contexts around the world. And this means that we have really the potential to look at developing future innovations for India and for global needs, uh, but also start working on ensuring delivery of these new products. And as we all know, the challenge with antibiotics is we do, just don't need to make them available, but we also need to ensure good stewardship and use uh, to ensure their long-term um, viability. Uh, finally, I'd like to end by just noting uh, what GARDP is already doing in India. We're already conducting several projects in India. We've recently con conducted a big neonatal uh, study that was a multi-center, multi-country uh, uh, country study. India was an important participant on that. Um, we're also conducting pharmaceutical development activities on a new chemical entity with an Indian partner here. Um, and so we would like to obviously continue focusing on clinical and pharmaceutical development access and stewardship. And my colleague, Seamus O'Brien, will be talking a little bit about that later. Um, we also would like to work on and are working on building and strengthening strategic partners with key institutions, as well as both public and private organizations for technical collaboration. Um, we would like to continue engaging with actors, including um, uh, um, the CDSO on the regulatory roadmap and understanding what is required here in India for development of antibiotics. Uh, and understanding how we can harmonize this with other regulatory agencies. Why? Because we would also like to ensure that we can conduct global drug development projects here in India from the outset uh, and not wait till these are developed and, and, and registered in other countries. Uh, therefore, we would also like to work with partners to consolidate trial networks here in India. We believe India would be an extremely important place to conduct clinical development uh, in the future, both for adults and pediatrics and for regulatory and strategic trials. And therefore, this will allow us to get innovative products from all over the globe to be launched in India uh, in the most expedited fashion, but potentially also work with partners and pharmaceutical companies, and, and I would say especially biotechs here in India, um, who can conduct um, homegrown innovation here in India and conduct their clinical development activities here in India. Um, we would like to continue working on manufacturing and supply chain investment including with generic companies who have the know-how and expertise, uh, bearing in mind that in the antibiotic space, pharmaceutical development often lags behind um, the clinical development um, uh, for many reasons. And so there's a huge added value that can be brought in here. And uh, importantly, we would like to ensure accelerated pathways for pediatric um, drugs. We cannot forget that children and newborns are the most impacted population, and we need to ensure that their needs uh, do not come several years uh, or decades later. Uh, and finally, importantly, we would like to explore with partners here new access models for central uh, antibiotics, not just on how we can conserve and, and, and steward antibiotics, but also ensure how can we ensure that people who need these antibiotics get them. Uh, and after all, if we can't ensure access to these countermeasures, why do we uh, uh, invest millions of and dollars um, doing these activities? So um, I would like to thank all our partners. We are very excited to be moving forward to work with um, um, DBT and through them, through particularly BRAC. Um, we feel that we um, can really achieve things together, uh, working through practical collaborations and really helping uh, to work and build partnerships here in India um, that will benefit um, the country and the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, for giving a comprehensive, you know, uh, area of activities of RP and the potential of how they can expand in India. Now I would like to invite uh, Sri Pankaj Patelji, the chairperson of Zydus Karila, to give his talk on the role of industry for innovation in India. I will just share my presentation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
So, can you see my presentation now? Not yet. Not yet. I'm so it surprised. is not. It is not. It is not uh, coming up. It has come up now. Yes. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for inviting me, DBT and Bayrak, for this uh, interactions. And I would love to basically share with you my own uh, understanding and uh, uh, thinking about what the role of industry, particularly Indian industry, uh, in the area of these uh, neglected diseases are concerned. So if you see antibiotic resistance, we all discuss about a big problem. The biggest challenge the industry faces is the financial risk. Because if you look at doing research, the kind of reward the companies have got because of developing drugs into certain areas are significantly higher. Whereas in the case of antibiotic, it's actually negative returns which it obtains. And I think that's why we need to collectively work to find out how do we make systems so simple and, pure and transparent to make sure that we can develop antibiotic uh, uh, resistant drugs at much, much lower cost. So that's the first point which I wanted to draw here. I'm not going to get into numbers. If I say, you know, about $1.5 million billion is what generally is required basically to, to launch a new antibiotic drug compared and it takes about 10 to 12 years to do it. Now that where the MPV becomes completely negative for the pharmaceutical industry. And that's why you will find less and less pharmaceutical company is getting involved into it because they do not have any other support available. And a lot of these money is basically spent on the early phase and late phase clinical studies mostly. So one need to really think that how we can bring out. Of course, one I would like to highlight here, these are the global data. Indian data will be significantly lower than what I saw here. So I think uh, what we need is a, basically a push and pull mechanism to make this happen. The push mechanism would be that we can give research grants for specific things. We can give tax incentives. We can create public private partnerships. And of course, uh, non dilutive funding can be provided. Uh, the other pull mechanism could be, uh, you know, kind of accelerated re regulatory pathway. I think we all have learned during COVID times the regulatory timelines can be significantly compressed. And it cannot be, we cannot make that happen only for COVID infections, but we also need to now do it for every other thing which is happening in the drug research and healthcare. Of course, the somewhere the market ex exclusivity can be extended so the returns can be better. I think uh, pricing is a major challenge and I think Premium pricing can also uh, improve the returns. And of course, uh, some kind of guaranteed revenue uh, could also make sure that people will get more interest. What I see is the Indian pharma industry has capability to do things. So we have significant capability in the uh, work, whether it is vaccine or new chemical entity or peptides or biologics or even stem cell. We also have development capability where we can do whole of the CMC area, uh, the preclinical work, etc. And of course, manufacturing capability, we also have capability to do clinical trials. And then of course, we have shown number of company, our own company have developed this new drug, Lipaglin, which is basically for uh, NFL and NASH, currently undergoing uh, phase 2B study in US, and it's already approved in India. Uh, so what we do at Zydus, I will briefly say it, we believe that we, we as a company should also contribute whatever in a humble way we can do as far as the antibiotic resistance program is, is, is concerned. So we have a molecule which is codenamed ZAB260 and basically it's a tropoisomer 2 and 4 inhibitor and we are currently doing IND enability study uh, basically works at the drug resistance specific bacteria which we just talked about it. We also work on another molecule, which is ZAB612, which is dihydrofluorate reductase inhibitor, which is again in the candidate profiling stage. And it is uh, will be mostly used for lung infections, UTI, skin, and gonorrhea. We also work uh, on uh, tuberculosis also as a very important part for India. And there we have two different molecules. One is ZTB3291. Uh, 
Of course, it's an undisclosed mechanism, but the, it is currently in the preclinical development stage. It basically works on the multi-drug resistance tuberculosis. And then there is ZTB 3290, which is a protein synthesis inhibitor, uh, which is in the preclinical development stage, which also works in the multi-drug resistance tuberculosis. As you all are aware that we also have been working with MMV for the single dose cure for malaria. We just completed our phase one study in Australia for the ZY3278 drug, which is we work in collaboration with MMV. And uh, we are going to move into clinical phase two, three very soon. As you all are aware that we also developed the vaccine for uh, COVID infection. So it's called Zycovid D and uh, it is now currently undergoing phase three clinical trials in 28,000 subjects. So to end, I can only say, oh, sorry, I just push out that also we developed a first in kind in collaboration with WHO, the monoclonal antibody cocktail for rabies infection. And this was done in collaboration with, which was actually developed from the base from the beginning in 2009. And now it has a market authorization in India for, uh, and that's the first of its kind in the world for uh, 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 monoclonal requirement in rabies infection. So we have some experience of working with global agencies and we've learned that, that the experience tells us very clearly that it is a lengthy process. It takes time. We have to work together. We have to hand hold each other, understand each other problems and, and have sympathy for each other and make sure that we keep on pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. And then of course we can make things happen. So I welcome this initiative by DBT and by REC and also DNDI and other organization that we really can, Indian industry is definitely looking at how we can collaborate more and bring and create issue as drugs, which can solve some of the issues which the mankind is facing. Uh, we also, uh, have worked with ICMR to develop the COVID kit and uh, during the pandemic time. And I think finally, I think what we need is this, and this slide I have shown at many platforms, but I always like to say it, our regulatory system and landscape has to significantly change to enhance innovation and support innovation. We have to get more funding happening into R&D through different ways. Better collaboration between industry, academia, Government labs is a very is a need of the hour. Of course, a favorable policy landscape can definitely support. And finally, we need to sub utilize the high quality infrastructure exists within part of India that everybody who has an idea or a product can use it and make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing us the activities and the innovation that has been done by Zydus Cadillac. Now I will hand over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Vinita, please. Thank you, Dr. Suman. Uh, moving forward, we are having a panel discussion focusing on fostering innovation and in R&D to address infectious diseases in India and beyond. May I now request Dr. Harish Ayer from Gates Foundation to introduce the panel and to take forward the discussion. Dr. Harish. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vinita. What an exciting uh, discussion so far, an exciting set of presentations. We have a wide range of uh, panelists that we have about 20 minutes or so to talk through. So hopefully we can go quickly in a couple of minutes. And what I'll do is I'll try and ask each panelist uh, a quick question. I will introduce them very briefly, essentially a title, sort of a you know introduction. Uh, but obviously, this is a huge, big issue. I think it's very clear if COVID was a problem of a certain magnitude, AMR is a problem of a far, far bigger magnitude in my mind. Uh, but I think going back to the point that Dr. Patel just made, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Pradhan from the DCGI's office. Dr. Pradhan, good to have you here. Um, I think a key element of much of this and what we've seen in the COVID vaccine development world uh, also is the fact that the regulators actually can move quite quickly. In India, for COVID vaccine, we essentially had a vaccine approved within around nine to 10 months, I think, of initiating of the whole thing coming to bear, you know, in March in India. So I wanted to get your sense of very briefly, uh, you know, what do you think are the steps that DCGI is considering to increase um, 
the speed at which drug development uh, can happen in India, uh, how do we boost R&D and innovation from a regulatory perspective? It would be great to get quickly your thoughts on that, Dr. Pradhan. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for inviting uh, us in this uh, important uh, program. Sir, as uh, everybody knows, because in India, yes, we have uh, already approved two vaccines in a fast track mode, considering the urgent need and, uh, you know, of, uh, of the country because of COVID pandemic situation. Actually, the regulatory landscape, because many uh, our previous uh, speaker has rightly mentioned that, you know, the regulatory landscape play an important role uh, on in this overall ecosystem for innovation of new therapeutics for to tackle the problems of AMR and also the neglected tropical disease. In line with that, uh, government, Ministry of Health and CDSO is uh, continuously engaged to streamline the process and also to bring out, you know, bring uh, uh, regulatory uh, provisions, regulatory interventions in terms of amendments and uh, also in terms of preparing uh, guidelines or giving guidance on regulatory pathways, uh, continuous engagement with the stakeholders, etc. So uh, with, with this background, I would just like to mention that uh, uh, I think many of us are aware that how that new drugs clinical trial rules, which has been published by Government of India in 19th March 2019, how it actually enables the uh, developer to develop the pro new therapeutics uh, in a in a fast track process because we have many uh, provisions under the uh, said rules which actually uh, improve the transparency accountability and also predictability and there are provisions uh, with with specific timelines for disposal of and a review process of applications of clinical trials and new drugs one of the that uh, uh, provision is that the timeline is 30 days if the re research and development is done in India and also it is manufactured in India for any new therapeutics then the timeline for uh, uh, approval of any clinical trials is 30 days and if no reply is uh, you know received from the regulators within 30 days then it will be considered deemed approved uh, uh, types of things. In that case, the regulator, uh, the applicant can actually inform the regulator that okay, 30 days is over, and we are actually uh, processing all such applications of IND investigational new drug which are now being developed in India uh, within uh, that uh, timelines. Otherwise, under normal situation, the timelines is uh, 90 days for any other types of clinical trial applications. Similarly, for approval of new drugs, also that 90 days is the uh, timelines which is. Uh, there in the rules and we have detailed provisions uh, of you know uh, how to consider uh, uh, accelerated approval of a new drugs considering the uh, serious life-threatening disease and also the severity rarity and also considering the special relevance any disease which has a special relevance to Indian health scenario then we have a, a clear provision that the process can be you know uh, approved on an accelerated approval uh, mode and uh, based on the in case of remarkable efficacy marketing approval may be based on phase two clinical trial data also that provision is also there and also there is provision for expeditious review process that applicant can actually apply to regulators that uh, this is the uh, you know results even if the complete uh, clinical trial approval uh, has been done or not before that also they can uh, apply to the regulators seeking expedited review for a, a new drugs and we fully understand the importance of development of new antimicrobials antibiotics and also the uh, drugs which are uh, actually specific for neglected disease and considering that we are uh, uh, you know taking all measures from regulatory point of view and we uh, conduct our uh, subject expert because we have large pool of experts and uh, that experts actually review uh, our applications in consultation with CDSU and we try to uh, you know uh, dispose application as quickly as possible and therefore we conduct the meetings regularly we, we take uh, various measures to stimulate the process yes Dr. Thank Dr. You. Thank I you. will 
I'm sorry, I will cut you off because we have only 12 more minutes, but that's very helpful to hear. And I think Dr. Suman and Dr. Vinita have been a little bit unfair to me because so many exciting questions can be asked just on this one. You know, you have the industry people and academics on this crowd. It would be so exciting to get more into it. Unfortunately, we won't have time. I want to now take it over to um, Lena from MSF because, you know, we've not heard actually the civil society voice yet in this conversation so far. So as we all know, uh, you know, both patient, you know, subjects are both benefiting, patients benefit greatly from some research, but also uh, how do we make sure that uh, they also are giving of themselves in this whole risk reward game of trying new things. Would love to understand from her, what do you think, civil, how do you think civil society is handling the desire to do more work more rapidly? What are the pros and cons? What do you think are, uh, you know, successes in your advocacy efforts that, I mean, MSF has been a, you know, Medicines Access has been a huge, huge part of globally. Over to you, Lina. Yeah, so I would just like to highlight that uh, 20 years ago, uh, as MSF, we highlighted the problem for both access and innovation. And um, we did some work around it, uh, providing evidence and uh, we're very happy to have DNDI and CARPI initiatives that are now contributing to R&D in a way that uh, we had actually dreamt of, which is, you know, having uh, pediatric formulations, looking at uh, antibiotic resistance. Um, one thing I just really wanted to highlight that uh, today's civil society and uh, patient groups uh, are a very sophisticated group of experts, actually, because they do follow pipelines of treatments. And I can actually give to Virat uh, my wish list right from uh, liposomal amptofacin B to antivenoms uh, um, and so on. So I think we are, we are far more, we are far Oops, I think you, yeah, you, you yeah, broke up. So we also, sorry, I'll just say that today's civil society is uh, far more sophisticated um, than it used to be. And I think HIV AIDS changed us. Today we follow pipelines, we look at gaps, we challenge intellectual barriers and uh, uh, regulatory barriers. And we program today on the DRTV program. And I think on AMR, particularly, I would say that the involvement of civil society is very crucial because they will provide uh, uh, the political mobilization that funding requires. Um, that requires uh, that the drugs and products are accessible. Um, the last point I wanted to make is that there's no point developing something when it's very expensive. And so I can't agree uh, on the exclusivity um, demand from industry at all, you know. Of course, you have to, that's an interesting, uh, challenging point to stop at. Uh, you know, the other person we have not heard from is academia. And I would like to invite uh, Dr. Thomas from ETH uh, Zurich to comment on uh, the intersection of AMR policy. How do you have economic measures? What's the incentives the globe has and the high income world, the low income world? How do they think about uh, appropriate uh, antibiotic use? You know, in some cases, obviously, in the animal agriculture world, there's probably way excess use. But would love to hear your thoughts, uh, Thomas. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your question and, and the invitation uh, today. So I think we heard many things very interesting about innovation today, about finding new drugs, uh, which is of course essential. Uh, however, it's also clear that the new drugs alone are not uh, the solution here, uh, because we know that resistance is fueled uh, by the, the excessive use of drug in, in certain uh, in certain sector. So there needs to be a policy effort towards conservation of drugs, as well as there needs to be one towards innovation. And I think the best uh, alternative to using antibiotic is to really create the conditions necessary not to have to use them. Uh, and in humans, this would mean really investing into the best possible hygiene practices and providing access to clean uh, and safe water. And in the animal sector, it's the same recipe, essentially. We need, we need to make sure we do, that, we do that in a clean and hygienic way and, you know, encourage frequent cleaning and perhaps have uh, incentives uh, for that, you know, helping adapt the standards of uh, the way farming is done in different parts uh, of the world. There may be opportunities for alternatives to antibiotics too, as well, from the development side. And I think India certainly starts in a, uh, an ideal uh, position for this. But I think we need to be realistic 
because there's no silver bullet that's going to replace all the functions that antibiotics do for us uh, at, the, at the moment. So if we want alternatives to antibiotics, we need to make sure that these are not too expensive, essentially. Uh, and there's, there's two ways to do that. Either we really come to the market with cheaper product, or we reduce the price differential between antibiotics and other uh, alternatives to the future. And one of the ideas to achieve that uh, is, is to look at uh, antibiotics as a, as a common good. So from the point of view of the user of the antibiotic, antibiotics provide a service to him or her. Uh, but it's a form of pollution for the whole of society. And so here you can sort of apply the polluter pay principle, uh, and that would be imposing a tax on the use of antibiotics. So if you use too much, you're taxed. More. Now, there's two advantages of a taxation system uh, to prevent the overuse of, of antibiotics. First, it's much easier to enforce at the level of the manufacturer than a regulation would be at the level of farmers, especially in countries where you have a lot of farmers and not so easy to do the oversight of what's being done where. The other advantage of a, of a tax system on the overuse of antibiotics is that you can use the proceedings of the tax to reinvest that in research and uh, development. So here we may have a, a virtuous cycle uh, by having uh, those, those solutions that goes through taxation, but also for the purpose of serving the development uh, of a new drug. And we think that's particularly relevant to the animal sector. Very interesting economic uh, thinking that has to be brought into play, obviously, here. Um, I'd like to now move to um, Anand. Anand, um, uh, you know, it's you're a young innovator uh, in India, um, working, doing some really amazing stuff. Uh, want to hear about the challenges of doing R&D within India. How do you think the, I know this is a long topic, but I'll try and request a quick answer for you. How do you think the bayrak guard collaboration that uh, was talked about by uh, Dr. Sarin in the beginning, uh, how do you think that can help companies like yours? I know you probably have thoughts on the regulatory system as well that you heard from Dr. Pradhan, but would love to hear your thoughts, you know, from the government funding partnership, um, global partnership and how they can help uh, your work. Great. Thanks, Harish. And thanks to Suman and others for having me here. Congratulations to DBT Bayrak, uh, DNDI and Gartpi. Very, very important uh, uh, association. So Harish, doing innovation from India is exceptionally difficult. And uh, in AMR, it gets even more difficult because there is no market. So, uh, so you are double whammied that the science is so difficult, which is why you have less than 10 novel, novel therapies going through the world. And then the economics, as Dr. Pankaj showed very clearly, it's minus, minus 150 or 200 million NPV. But what has Bayrak done in the last 10 years or so, or I'm sorry, maybe about less than 10 years since Bayrak started, has been phenomenal. Today, we have an ecosystem including where I sit in Bangalore, Sea Camp, Harish, where, we, is, where it's very conducive to doing innovation. This was not the case, say, even seven years ago. So A, innovation has come in. Access to pathogens in India is fantastic compared to my peers in, in Boston or the Bay Area, multi-drug, pan-drug resistant isolates. And the early grant support that Bayrak gave allowed us to be who we are. Do we need more deep funding from Bayrak because the drug discovery needs a lot of sustained funding? The answer is yes. But they gave us when it mattered the most, that seed funding. Now your question. Gart P, Bayrak coming together is going to solve one multiple problems, but the biggest problem it solves for the innovator is to create global clinical trial networks in India for AMR. So high class data can be created from India where it's relatively easy to find multi-drug resistant acinetobacter or pseudomonas patients compared to Basel or Birmingham or, or Boston. What if I can do a chunk of my trials in India and that data becomes valuable in dossiers with EMEA, FDA, PNDA. So the guard P, BIRAC coming together along with ICMR support, if there can be two, three, four, five clinical trial net networks that are doing high, high performance, high class, high, high data quality trials, global data harmonization. That's why Dr. Pradhan and his team will come to the table as well to, to talk much more to the FDA and talk much more to EMEA to make sure our data is acceptable everywhere. So tough question, long question, but yeah. quick answer yeah. is the two coming now, together for the clinical trial networks. So thank you. That's perfect. So this is why I have changed the order of the questions that I had at the beginning. So now uh, Dr. Shishendu Mukherjee and uh, Dr. O'Brien, it's pretty clear what uh, we need to do to certainly spur you know new molecules coming into the system 
and have harmonization ac across regulators. So Shishendu, over to you. How do you think this relationship uh, will work? What do you think its goals are? And then I'll go to uh, Dr. O'Brien after you. Uh, thank you, Harish. I think uh, Dr. Uh, Sareen and Vinita in the beginning highlighted, you know, our 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 goals and clear uh, clear mandates of DV2 Direct is to how to tackle AMR through our various funding initiatives. You know, he, uh, the core DBT funding initiative on the new molecule discovery to academic, Virax initiative on funding industry and startups on managing AMR, not only through drug development, but through diagnostics, developing tool for surveillance, uh, managing hospital infections, and also managing, you know, looking at uh, AMR and to, you know, managing the effluents and looking at. So they are, they, they, there is a broad portfolio of programs which DBT Virax runs. To tackle the, the, the you know the, the manage AMR in a big way, so uh, you know the drug development and new drug discovery is one of the major elements of that program. This uh, this collaboration, which between uh, will be relished uh, a lot, the DBT is BIRAC, the NDI and GARP collaboration, and I think this will be a very end-to-end -end, uh, approach towards R&D of neglected the diseases and infectious diseases outbreaks in India. We are going to look that. How to manage new pandemics and how to how to I think this will look at especially through drug discovery, and uh, and then to develop clinical trial networks and helping large scale implementation of studies. You know, lab we are doing well, but how to implement in a bigger way? Biorac is really geared to deliver that along with DBT support to deliver it. Uh, you know, in a larger uh, larger trial, larger manufacturing and evaluation, not only in India but take it through our inter platforms globally as well. Discovering, developing affordable drugs. I think that is one of the and co-create some solutions. And we in India, got we have libraries of compounds which can be brought to India, and we have, can help them through our academic networks to co-create them and ensure what I think is important is affordable and accessible drugs to India and beyond. That will be one of the core element of I think uh, supporting new drug development uh, on NTDs and other things. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Vishendu. Dr. O'Brien, you know, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the same topic, right? What are the challenges of running clinical trials? And I will also ask uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Mowbray at the end to see what he thinks has been some positives here. But love to hear from Dr. O'Brien first on what are the challenges in running trials in India? What do you think could be done better? Uh, it would be, you know, in this context of Anand's, con you know, comments as well. Thank, thank you. Um, in context time, I'll go fairly quickly. I, I think we had an excellent workshop in 2019 hosted by Guard P and, and ICMR, and I think that really did focus on some of the challenges. One of the key challenges that has been addressed by Dr. Pradhan um, is clarity around the regulatory process for clinical trial applications and accelerating that. So I won't cover that. That's, that's moving definitely in the right direction. <laughs> Um, the work that ICMR have been doing and others on um, ethics committees, training and support for those, and I think that's another great step forward. I think what I would focus on is is really um, sort of building capability. Um, um, Anand is absolutely right. There's a great opportunity to conduct trials in India to generate data for those sort of core regulatory bacterial infections or indications, whatever you want to call them, and also to generate data for those populations which actually have a drug resistant infection with the multi drug resistant profile that we're concerned about. However, to do that, we have to really address um, the capacity to, to sort of support research infrastructure within hospitals in India. Um, also, address issues around um, training. Um, the, make sure the investigators get the training to be able to conduct the studies to a high quality standard and a regulatory standard. And I think. To do that, you 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 can um, look at sustainability. So um, by by having that building that capability and training, you can you can lead to a sustainable group, which becomes a network of individuals, both coordinators, nurses, pharmacists, and investigators. So they can they can um, be involved in setting up a one study, learn the learn the steps that are involved, and then move on to another study. So you don't lose that um, uh, knowledge that you built up. From a, from a study and that's that's a sort of classical industry CRO approach which is which has happened in the past which is not great particularly um, for antibiotics because um, you really do need to have that specific knowledge of, of mm. conducting clinical trials in an acute disease acute bacterial disease 
And the last thing I would say is we, we do need to make sure we support our clinical investigations with enabling science. And I think one of the key areas is, is, is surveillance to make sure we connect the um, good data that's coming out of India in terms of uh, antimicrobial surveillance, connect that actually to clinical epidemiology so we can understand the, the burden of disease from the <clears throat> resistance data we're seeing then that helps us to place the clinical trials in the right locations. So I'll stop there because I know we're short of time. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. O'Brien. I think it's interesting with all the genomic sequencing that's being discussed today on the virus, you know, how we leverage some of that. And maybe if I have a minute more, I'll move on to Dr. Mowbray also. He, uh, I think, uh, you know, we heard earlier about the eight new innovations that DNDI has come up with. And so obviously there have been some successes would love to hear from you, given those, what are uh, your, in your sense, the opportunities in India and how we can contribute to both our own internal problems and to the world on, on new new drugs and uh, for these very, very important but highly neglected indications. Over to you. Oh, thank you. I, I, well, I think there's some key, key drivers for success that we need to keep in mind. Um, we have to have a clear focus on the needs of patients and not to deviate from this. I think we, we've heard that it's difficult to engage in, in neglected diseases. Um, so to, to bring the partners into this ecosystem, we need to be flexible and we need to work with partners across sectors. So public and private, bringing the excellent uh, science that's going on in the academic sector, coupling that with the expertise in, in the industry to actually develop new drugs and, and, and also working with governments, ministries of health and, and research institutes to complete that journey together. No one party will do all of that on their own. Flexibility and pragmatism. So what's the real problem? You don't necessarily need to do discovery for all diseases. You need to finish the job and make sure the drugs are made, made available. But throughout all of this, we need to strive for excellence and quality. So it's a neglected disease, but we need to bring 21st century science and technology and make sure that we've got really high quality treatments that, that will be successfully developed and made available. So I think Many, many important ingredients for us in, in India in our work and continuing to connect those and, and to build the ecosystem for neglected diseases, um, but also recognizing the role of that in contributing to the, the solution for these diseases globally. So it may be a discussion about control for Kalazar in India, but it, we're not at that stage in other regions and the, the lessons and the tools that have been developed in India can really help globally. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mowbray, to you know, urging us to stay focused. I hope that uh, all that we've learned from COVID also will play an important part uh, in really spurring this effect. Over to you, um, Dr. Suman, Dr. Vinita, over to you. I think we are five minutes late. To this Thank you, Dr. Harish, uh, for the wonderful and exciting discussion over the AMR and the neglected diseases. I now call upon my colleague, Dr. Suman, to, uh, for proposing closing remarks. Dr. Suman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vinita. In, in, as we have very little time or we have already crossed our limits, I would like to make it as short as possible. It would be very difficult to uh, summarize the discussions, but it has been extremely rich. Just a few points maybe I'd like to highlight is, first, the commitment of BIRAC and DBT for innovation for these diseases like NTD and AMR, which we are very happy to hear about. And we have a very good spectrum of stakeholders, right from the civil society, represented by Lina, right up to uh, R&D organizations from GARP, DNDI, and also innovators like Anand and, and, and international organizations like WHO. So I think it has been a very rich uh, discussion on understanding the needs, challenges, and also the opportunities. And it's been very good that we also have uh, Indian Pharma, which has always been associated with generics, but now we can see that it has been illustrated how uh, eager and how successful they have been in moving forward with innovations. So I think the, the dialogue needs to continue beyond this uh, one hour session. And I think this is a good opportunity for us to keep ourselves connected. And we look forward to this collaboration agreement between BIRAC uh, with the NDI and BIRAC with BARP to be able to have significant projects in here in, in India and uh, to be able to work in a multi-sectorial, multiple partnerships uh, together. So with that, I would like to thank all the speakers and participants who have uh, contributed their time and uh, given us uh, a 
very good perspective of um, these two disease areas. I would really like to thank uh, BIRAC and DBT for organizing this interesting and very important session. And uh, this is a uh, thank you from my side, yes. So I thank think we close the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.